Welcome to A Practice Pro CPD, brought to you by LawPro. I'm Joan Rutaik Lang. I'm the Executive Director of the Toronto Lawyers Association, and I'm really happy to be here today um, as we continue our series of Thursday Tips with Law Pro. These programs are interesting and informative and very popular. Uh, today's program is being recorded, so it will be available. There's going to be a lot of information. We were just having a little discussion uh, before we got started, and I know I'm going to be listening quite intently, and I imagine that you may want to replay some of it, or you may want to tell your friends about it who've missed it. So um, it's good to know that uh, this very important discussion on fraud will be available for everyone. I would like to um, acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you from Toronto, which is also where the offices of Law Pro are, and the Toronto Lawyers Association is located. I respectfully acknowledge that Toronto is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. As this meeting is virtual, we are all not gathered in the same space. And for many of you, this land acknowledgement is not for the traditional territory you are on. If so, we invite you to take some time to learn about and acknowledge the traditional territory and treaty lands that you are on. As a resource, please visit the website native-lands.ca to search a location to find the appropriate, appropriate territory acknowledgement under the resources tab or contact a Friendship Centre for guidance. I would like to recognize the long history of all First Nations in Ontario and the Métis and Inuit people. We thank First Nations people who, who lived and live in these lands for sharing them with us in peace. Now, before I turn it over to Judah, just a quick reminder about how today's program is going to be running. We've got a lot of information to cover, so we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box. That will be the easiest way for our moderator to make sure he can see the questions. Um, occasionally information will be shared with you, but that will be in the chat box. Um, so if you have a question, don't raise your hand. We can't go live. Um, we just have too much material and uh, it's just easiest for everyone if you use the chat box. I mean the Q&A box. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I will turn it over to Judah. Thanks oh. everyone. Thanks so much, Joan, and uh, thank you, as always, to the TLA for uh, partnering with LawPro to bring these programs. Uh, I'm Judah Strafczynski, Director of Practice Pro, which is LawPro's Claims Prevention and Risk Management Program. And first, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the Back to School event. Uh, for those who did have family members going back, uh, you can now share with them what you did today. Uh, in class, so to speak. But uh, this is an important program, Survival Tips to Prevent Fraud. Uh, our program materials are going to be put in the chat function, and those who are watching on a replay or watching live today can also access them at practicepro.ca slash CPD and just selecting today's program. So thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a follow-up to our December event, Avoiding the Fraud Nightmare, What You Need to Know to Protect Yourself and Your Clients. Um, we're going to build on what we talked about in December. For those of you who didn't attend then, I'd encourage you to review it when you have time, but you're not going to be lost. Uh, you can start with us today for sure. What we're going to do is first, we're going to review cyber risks. Uh, we're going to update you on frauds we've seen, we're seeing since we ran that December program. And we're gonna give you examples of the types of attacks we see targeting lawyers, law firms, law clerks, clients, review some of the examples of the scams that we've seen perpetrated. Unfortunately, some have been successful resulting in real harms. We will also share some saves that have happened from implementing some of the practices and the tips we're gonna talk about for today. Uh, second, we're gonna to look to some rising risks, particularly in real estate, we're going to talk about property owner impersonation frauds. There have been, there's been a really sharp increase, a disturbing trend up in these scams uh, pretty much over the last 12 months or so, where people have been impersonating homeowners and property owners 
and either selling or refinancing the property and running with the proceeds. It's a really dangerous uh, activity that we're seeing increasingly. So we're going to talk about the red flags today. We're going to talk about the tips you can do to reduce the risk of you being duped or of a client being duped. Third, we're going to review ID fraud, which really is one of those pieces that lies at the heart of so many of the frauds we're seeing today. We'll, we're seeing examples of individuals and corporations where the ID has been uh, manipulated or somebody has impersonated uh, the individual or corporation to perpetrate a fraud. We'll give some examples. We'll review a bit about how to go further to get a better handle and be comfortable when verifying ID. And we'll give you some resources as well. So uh, without going into any of the introductions for Ray or Mona, uh, they are uh, wonderful speakers. They are experts in the field. Their bios are in the program. So we're just going to jump right in with that first pillar. We're going to talk cyber right now uh, because we are seeing an increase. We're seeing wire frauds. We're seeing ransomware. Uh, they're targeting lawyers, and they are real dangers that lawyers and law firms, law firm ops staff, everyone in the firm needs to protect against. Uh, we've seen some that were thankfully prevented as well. Mona does work in this space. She's one of the experts who uh, goes to bat for, for law pro at times and others where there have been breaches, where there have been these types of cyber dangers emerging. So Mona, why don't you kick us off by sharing some of the examples that you're seeing uh, right now? For sure. Thanks, Judah. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you and Ray. Um, like Judah said, unfortunately, there are a number of cyber threats that are still plaguing lawyers uh, and that have really impacted the way we practice. So I'll talk about the two com more, more common types of frauds, like Judah mentioned, wire frauds and ransomware. Those are the two most popular type. Um, but we have seen cases involving website manipulation, um, like Judah mentioned, ID fraud. So there, there's a number of different types of threats, but certainly wire frauds and ransomware remain uh, two of the top, uh, top cyber risks right now. So wire fraud, very briefly, uh, involving lawyers in particular, it's been on the rise. Uh, in the last year alone, Law Pro has seen frauds range everywhere from 200,000 to 4 million. So it, it it, uh, these hackers really don't differentiate as soon as they can gain access to some type of email chain, you know, they will, uh, they'll put in the effort for even little bits of money. Um, so in a typical claim involving wire fraud, what we see is a hacker who gains access to legitimate email conversations, either between a lawyer and their client, um, or even between two lawyers discussing, you know, where funds are going to be transferred. Um, the hacker will usually get into one person's email account to start and they'll linger around. So they'll watch conversations, um, you know, they'll insert themselves into the discussion by responding to certain emails. They may respond directly from the email account that's been impacted. Um, or what they may do is they'll create a, a new spoofed email account that looks strikingly similar. So very often we see cases involving uh, fraudulent emails with an extra I, for example, or an extra S, for example, like something is something's different about the email, but not different enough that you would notice it if you were just glancing it, which is, um, you know, once we come back to our tips, <laughs> you want to be hyper vigilant anytime you receive an email. But um, so the hacker may create mail forwarding rules. So <clears throat> the hacker may start hiding emails in, in different folders so that you may not detect what's happening. Um, and meanwhile, you'll have the hacker responding to both sides of the conversation. So they'll respond to you, they'll respond to your client, all with the purpose of controlling the discussion so that you don't, you don't get tipped off in any way. So while this is going on, hackers usually track down legitimate documents contained in your email account, uh, and they'll manipulate them in some way. So it's all with a goal to reroute funds in some way. So think about, you know, a lender payout statement or a payment request on, a, on, on your letterhead. Uh, you know, they may find these, these documents attached as uh, attachments to emails. They may find them, you know, buried deep in, in folders that you've saved. You know, however they can gain access to these documents, they will. Um, but they'll edit them in such a sophisticated enough way so that you don't look twice. Unless you're really looking for something, you just think that they're, you know, they're legitimate documents. Of course, the hacker will then take the manipulated document, 
uh, with fraudulent banking uh, details that they've now edited into the document and they'll send it to either you or your client or whoever is supposed to be making a payment. And once often the hacker will continue the discussion with both parties, even after the wire transfer is made so that it can give them enough time to get the money out of the account that the funds have been wired to. Um, and then in the background, you know, with the banks, they may have gotten into someone else's bank account. So it looks like a legitimate transfer. They may have their own bank accounts under someone else's name. It's, it gets really complicated even once the funds leave, uh, leave the account. But by the time anyone detects the fraud or calls the bank, more often than not, the money's gone. Um, so the good, the good news story is as of recently, banks have been really on top of uh, wire frauds uh, to the point where, you know, if you catch it early enough, they may be able to trace back funds. But what we're finding more and more is that banks are requiring you to issue a, a, an application or a claim uh, against the bank for a tracing order to retrieve the funds or even to get any information about where the funds went. So it's getting really complicated now, even after the funds leave. So um, it, it just becomes a big mess even after the fraud is, is uh, uh, takes place. So the next issue, as I mentioned, is ransomware, which you know has been and will continue to be a significant ongoing threat to any business in Canada. It's just uh, there, it's not going away. There's no uh, there's no signs of it. We see sort of peaks and valleys. So we see we see it sort of taper off a little bit or hit a certain industry, but then it ramps right back up. So you know new threat actor groups are constantly emerging. Uh, you know we're seeing different types of behaviors with different threat actor groups. I was uh, mentioning to. Uh, to Judah and Ray earlier that, you know, right now we're seeing some threat actor groups getting into the system, getting into your IT environment and deleting data. So it's sort of, it, it, it doesn't make sense as to why they're doing it, but they just want to keep you off their scent. So, um, but what we typically see is that someone within your firm will have received a, a fraudulent or a phishing email. They will have clicked a link or opened an attachment. Uh, and from there, the hacker will be able to obtain this person's password. Um, if, if the firm does not have multi-factor authentication installed, which we'll talk about later, uh, the hacker will be able to access the environment, you know, and, and lurk around. We see hackers searching for uh, insurance policies. They'll search for bank statements, anything to gain intel on the business so that they can hold them for ransom. But uh, what we do see is that they'll drop the ransomware after a certain amount of time and your systems are locked. So it's, it, unfortunately, it's a, it's a big problem from a cost perspective. It's a big problem from a uh, business perspective because you just can't operate until you get some type of decryption tool. But um, it gets very complicated quickly. And unfortunately, without giving, without giving coverage advice, a ransomware incident is not typically covered under law pros policy, given that it's not an error or a mission in the provision of professional services. So you know, this is why we always encourage everyone to get cyber insurance. Um, but but no matter how big or small your firm is or um, but anyone who has experienced a ransomware incident will know how devastating it is to the business and how costly it will get. So uh, two of the bigger threats right now. But Jude, I'll hand it over to you now that I've sufficiently scared everybody. No, thanks, Mona. I mean, it's not it's not just scaring. It's It's just real life. This is where it's at. Uh, I'm sure you in your personal life get all of these vishing, phishing, smishing types of correspondence to emails that are trying to get information from you or texts. I've had one who multiple times this week has just texted me out of nowhere saying, sorry, I'm at lunch. I'll send you the money later today. It's like, what? I don't know who you are. This is clearly somebody who just wants to get banking information from me. Pass right? On LinkedIn, somebody saying, hey, who are you? I've never heard of you. You're starting to ask where I'm based. It's in my profile, but you know, clearly you're starting to try to dig for other information. So you're, you're always taking care in your personal life. You have to take care in your professional life as well. To the point around coverage, it's an important piece. And in our December program, uh, we talked about it at length and there are resources there to talk about the insurance piece. And it is an important part of the considerations. I would say this though, it's at the end. Today, we're gonna to look at the prevention. You know, the fences to avoid you falling off the cliff. Insurance is there to save you if you've fallen. It's your parachute, it's your safety net, however you wanna put it. But today we're gonna to focus on the prevention piece. So if you wanna think about all of the coverages you should have, which I encourage you to do, the December program has resources and a good discussion about that. But today we're really gonna front load that prevention because those pieces are vital and some of the tips we're going to talk about 
are going to be required to be implemented in any event if you do want to get cyber insurance. Those insurers want you to be taking certain steps to reduce your risk. Otherwise, the threat for some of them in terms of looking at your risk will be too high to bother to insure. So they set default rules around tech use uh, to make sure that you are well protected. So if you start with today's tips and implement them, then you can get to the cyber insurance discussions more easily. So I want to start with a good news story. And the good news story is this. Mona talked about the types of threats you face. And we see them. We see them at LawPro all the time. We know that there are others where people may not report a gift card scam, where they know that they didn't make a mistake in the practice of law, but the law firm is now out a couple of thousand dollars because somebody emailed you know, gift card pins to somebody who they thought was their boss around holiday time because the purported boss through an email who was mimicking the boss has said, I need this ASAP sort of stuff. We know that there's a, there are all sorts of ransomwares where somebody may not report to us because they know that it may not trigger our, our coverage. We'd encourage you to report these to us. Uh, we may not be able to help, but it's always good to let us know if there is in fact something impacting your firm on the cyber front. It helps us also better prepare for these sorts of sessions. And if there is coverage, then you know we're there for you. Uh, but you know, on the wire fraud ones, there often have been cases where clients have been impacted. The good news story is that by implementing some of these uh, changes immediately, we're seeing progress. We're seeing that things are in fact improving. So I'm gonna give you an example. When we ran our December program, we talked about calling before you click. We talked about independently verifying if a wire comes, instruction comes in by email, checking your contact information separate from that email, because the, the fraudster may have changed that number, find that bank, that firm, that, that contact person's number that you have or that you can independently find and call across to verify that the sender did in fact, was the sender you had, you had in mind and did in fact intend to send you that wire information. And we want you to do it every time because sometimes the hackers have already hacked into the system prior to any wire information or payment details going out. Sometimes they come in late and ask for a change. In either case, we need you to call across and we'll talk a bit about that in a bit. But in December, we talked about it. And one firm, one lawyer was watching and encouraged the rest of the firm, including support staff, to watch the program. And as it happened, that firm was asked to discharge mortgage by wire. And the mortgage company had made it very clear on their standard documentation that due to COVID, they would prefer, they weren't insisting, but they strongly preferred wire payments because it was difficult for them to process matters because of staffing issues with return to office, et cetera. And so the standard that people were looking at was to wire the funds. In between watching this program and the deal needing to close, that firm received a wire redirection where they were asked to send the money to a different account and the red flag got caught. Their staff saw that as a significant issue and they took the next steps to determine what had prompted this wire direction. They concluded that this was an improper act, that this was not in fact a legitimate request from their bank and so they sent the funds at the end of the day to the bank as per the original directions after confirming in, in their ways that this was not a legitimate redirection. I'm not able to get into all of the details about all of the red flags because it may show a bit more too much detail about the entities, but there were things in this transaction that cumulatively or independently would have given anyone cause for pause and the need, even if you hadn't done it before, to pick up the phone and call across. 
that fraud would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it got saved. And if you think about that save and what it did, it saved the firm from having to report a claim where they possibly could have been found liable. It saved the insurer the cost of defense counsel. It saved the firm potentially now that somebody else would have received their banking information, all sorts of costs to try to chase money, to try to fix their systems if they subsequently were compromised after sending this information and giving out banking information and law firm information. It saved their clients the grief of having an outstanding amount owed to a bank with a transaction, a subsequent transaction potentially in limbo. So that one moment, that one moment is where you can save so much down the road. And in this case, that's exactly what happened. And they were kind enough to let us know that that's exactly what happened. And to say, we need to continue this sort of programming because it was that close for them. They felt it, they knew that there was always that risk that it could have gone and they could have missed it. But with training, and with continuous improvement, their systems are now one step ahead of where they were. It doesn't add very much time and it gave them entire peace of mind. We've also heard from some others who came and wrote to us in December after our program to say they've implemented our key changes because it helps to foster their security and the peace of mind was worth it for them. So that's one example. Here's another example that we've seen, and it goes back to one of Mona's uh, cases. It's around hacked emails. Um, and all of this is going to get towards takeaways and our key tips, so don't worry. Uh, but these are just to give you examples because they can happen. And I want to give you a couple of cases, one where there was a save because of a change, and one where this one, where something happened that prompted a change and thankfully no one was hurt. But in this one, a law firm was hacked recently. And the hacked email account that the fraudster found was not adequately protected. It didn't have two-factor authentication, which meant that the fraudster, upon guessing, hacking, finding, locating uh, uh, the proper password for entry, was able to just go straight into the email system. Two-factor authentication is where before getting through, the system stops and says, oh, nice to see you again, Judah. We're going to text you a code to your phone. Or we're going to call you to make sure it's you. There are all sorts of ways to set this up. And if you've ever used a bank remotely, you know what I'm talking about. You can do this with Gmail. You can do this with Outlook. You can do this with most software platforms that you have, where you can say, before this happens, once I give you a password, I want you to then send me a text for that extra level of security. That two-factor authentication is vital. This firm didn't have it. Here's what happened. The hacker went in to the back end of the system and added new users. The firm didn't even know that these new users had been created. These new users were then sending all sorts of emails out to clients and others, and they were adding rules and keyword search rules so that anytime any file mentioned payment, mentioned check, mentioned keywords related to the bank transactions, they got a ping. Now, lawyers are busy with their everyday lives, and so something about sending a check might take a little bit of time to respond to, but a fraudster's sole job is to check these and wait for that opportunity to try to send diversion emails. Now, thankfully in this case, the firm was able to find this, law, this, this before any loss occurred. They were able to see what had happened. And frankly, they got lucky and they know they got lucky. And they've changed their systems now, working with their tech providers to enhance security, to make sure they have two-factor authentication in place. They were able to remove 
the new accounts, they were able to make sure that key information was maintained and that nothing was taken, which is a whole other risk factor when they dig around, like Mona said. What if that person who had infiltrated had then copied, pasted, and sent out lots of key information? We'd have data breach. We'd have privacy issues. We'd have all sorts of other things for a law firm to have to stick handle through. Thankfully, this was a near miss situation where it got caught early and where there were no harms. No harm, no foul, maybe, but thankfully that firm has enhanced its security. So, you know, these don't always result in losses necessarily, but they do create risk. They do create harm. They, for you, if you're there as a lawyer, as a law clerk, as a paralegal, as a student, they create stress, right? If you're out there and not checking, on where you're gonna send money and double checking that in the ways that we're recommending, then that's a high stress way of doing business. So with that in mind, we're gonna just talk about a few key takeaways about the cyber risks we're seeing today. So just generally to recap, as Mona's described, the frauds are becoming more and more sophisticated. They're doing all sorts of things out there, ransomware, wire fraud, you know, just running amok. It may involve a fake email, but it can involve a real email. You know, you've got to remember that horror movie moment where they turn and say the calls from inside the house or this, the slasher is inside. You know, you can't assume that just because it comes from a legit email address that the instructions are legitimate or that the wire instructions on bank stationery are legitimate. In our save case, the documentation was legitimate. It was from the right institution with a signature, with the account number, with all of the right information, except for where the money was to go. So you can't assume that what you're seeing is legitimate. You need to take steps to go further. You'll see from all of this that the wire frauds take planning. These people are not just you know, randomly shooting an email out there, hoping that you'll respond and retain them so that they can send you a bad check and hopefully you'll then give money back out of your trust account. That's still a risk out there, those, those trust account frauds, but they're not quite as sophisticated as what we are seeing now. The fraudsters are targeting all practice areas. We've seen it and you're gonna, you're gonna hear about real estate specifically in the next module that we'll get to, but we're seeing it in other areas as well. And we're seeing it at all size of firms as well. So with that as sort of the background, here are some key tips. And we'll start with you, Mona. Thank you, Judah. As you mentioned, my top tip is always two-factor authentication. There's so many cyber and privacy breaches that can be prevented with two-factor authentication. Um, and if anyone is unfamiliar with two-factor authentication, it's just the process whereby you're authenticating your identity by some independent means each time you log into your email, or to your document management system. So for example, when I log into my email, um, I get a, I have an app on my phone that produces a pop-up. I can't log into my email until I authenticate, until I verify that it is me who is logging into my email account, at which point I'd be granted access. So we've got this on our email account and on our document management system. So it, it I will be completely transparent with you. It can get annoying. But I know every time I click that, you know, I'm the one getting into my email account. Thankfully, I've never experienced a, a situation where I've gotten a prompt and it, it wasn't me logging into my email account. But you can see how that would sort of trigger a red flag in my mind that I'm getting a prompt, but, you know, I'm on a beach in Hawaii somewhere. Um, not me logging into my email account, that's for sure. So you can see how frauds can be prevented and how infiltrations can be prevented just by um, by having that added layer of security. Uh, so this two-factor authentication can come in various forms. So like Judah mentioned, you can get a telephone call where you have to authenticate verbally or, or you get a code via, via uh, telephone that you have to type in. Um, some people receive an additional password via text message that you'll, be have, that you'll have to input before granted access. Um, if any of you are like me and you do a lot of online shopping, um, it's becoming the norm where you get a code texted to your to your phone before you can complete the transaction. So that's another form of, of two-factor authentication, and it's all with the goal to prevent frauds. 
Uh, some people have physical dongles that populate an ID uh, at certain intervals so that you'll um, need to input it. I've seen this um, particularly with banks. There is that added, uh, you know, it, it's um, exceptionally secure because it's constantly changing. So it's almost impossible to hack into. Um, so 99% of the time, you know, a hacker will not be able to authenticate a login, even if they're able to gain access by some means. Like if they're at that point where they've got your credentials, you know, they're not getting in. Um, and, you know, if, if you can prevent an attack uh, this way, um, or sorry, if you if you can't access, you're, you're going to prevent the attack. So it's highly effective. And interestingly, it is becoming the standard. So many cyber insurers are requiring that you have two-factor authentication before you will get insured. Um, and so it's definitely worth considering if you haven't done so already. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you are hit with a ransomware uh, incident, typically not covered under the law pro policy. So you're really going to want to guard against it because like I mentioned, it does get costly very quickly. So my top tip, two-factor authentication. You know, it's our top tip today because it's also free. It's free to implement. So if you if you use Outlook as your, as your you know, if you're on Microsoft, uh, you can just search for how to do this online and it'll show you. If you have a systems administrator, this should take them about two seconds and then you can train your staff in about five minutes. Mona's right. It takes some getting used to. It's kind of annoying that you can't just hit the ground running. Uh, it's frustrating when you get logged out because you know your time session has expired. Not a bad thing to have though, if you think about what can happen when there's an open computer. So all of this is, is helpful and it is becoming increasingly the standard that cyber insurers are gonna be looking for. So it's free, it doesn't take long to do and it can save you significant, we're talking six to seven figure pain. And, and I will say this, we've seen cases uh, where the issue was not covered by us and the lawyer had to go back to their personal line of credit to repay. You know, this is not what we would want to see. We want a profession that's thriving. We want lawyers who've built careers and succeeded over time to thrive and to be proud of their work and, and not have to uh, deal with these sorts of struggles when they can be prevented. So tip one is implement that second two-factor authentication. Um, the second key, of course, call before you click. I've already mentioned it uh, already with the examples. But it's, again, just about calling the other side. And what's great about this one also, it doesn't take long, it's free to do. When you combine these two, these are two absolutely amazing, significant defenses that you can play in, in tandem. And they significantly reduce the risk. We have seen literature recently from some of the sort of tech spaces like ZNet, where they've mentioned that two-factor authentication, the very presence of two-factor authentication is helping ward off certain fraudsters. Why try to target you know, the best, the, 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 the well-fortified when you can go down the street and walk right in, right? And so if you implement this, it helps you become less of a, th a target the threat is reduced just by taking Mona's first step of the two-factor. In terms of the calling before you click, obviously it helps to reduce that risk of a wire gone wrong. And for this session, we've actually got a new resource and I'm gonna put it on the screen for a second with thanks to the Law Society of British Columbia uh, who had uh, created this. It's in the materials. It's also separately available as a sheet at Practice Pro, but this is a funds transfer instructions verification checklist. I know that's a mouthful, but what we figured is for anyone on the file, it may be helpful to remember what it is that you're looking for and to try to catch things. And so this is a simple thing that you can do to make sure that each time you are sending payment, you have a record of what you did to verify appropriately. So you're going to check the funds transfer that you received initially, and you're going to check the names. You're going to check that they match. You know, we've seen cases which have been a bit sloppy, where the verification, uh, the interception has sent a confirmation saying, oh, you know what? I owe money to so-and-so. Can you just send it to their account? And it's a corporate account, or it's a foreign account, which makes no sense given the parties who you're working with. 
So those are significant red flags there, right there. If you get an instruction to pay out to somebody who's not on a mortgage, to pay out to a company that's not your actual client on your retainer, you know, these are red flags. You can check with the verification. And again, don't use the phone number in the instructions. We want you to make sure you have an independent number. If somebody has scraped my account, they're going to put in their own cell phone number. So if you get an email in that's purportedly from me and you call me back on that number that shows up on that fake email, they're gonna pick up and say, yep, that's correct, go ahead. And the problem is that's not independent verification because it's all coming from one document. They're actually taking those steps with burner phones and otherwise. So you wanna make sure you can go check your file opening sheet can go check your retainer with your client to see what was the number they gave you initially, right? And then you can just document what you've done here and you can check and verify all of the payee and bank account details. And Ray's gonna talk a bit about that in a moment. And if it's okay, you're good to go. But really for anyone here, if anything fails on this, that's it, stop, hold on. Talk to us if you're not sure. Reach out to Practice Pro. But if the money goes out, we've also got what you do in that case as well. And so that's the new resource that we'd encourage you all to incorporate, use as you see fit. You know, if you need to tailor it to your unique circumstances, uh, by all means, do so. If you've got regular institutional clients, uh, you know, you can you can include this and show them that you're doing this. It shows your own clients that you are secure and uh, you're off to the races. Ray, I believe you've got our next tip. Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the program. Um, and uh, my tip is gonna be, how do you verify that the wire is actual money? Um, so it's a request and confirm a PCRN. Let me explain. Payments Canada, um, or back a bit. Um, our banking system in Canada is very good, um, but it works on trust. Um, we are a trusting society. They trust the money will be there. And so they give you instant credit. But when they give you credit, they can pull the credit back. Um, our concern, of course, is we want actual money. When you open your screen and you look at your bank account and you see the dollars in your account, you want to make sure it's a dollar and not a credit. How do you confirm that? Well, Payments Canada is the institution in Canada that sets the rules for banks on how to transfer money in, uh, between themselves um, going forward. They have two payment systems. Um, traditionally, we had the LBTS, uh, now Lynx, um, and uh, we had the ACSS. Um, they are modernizing those systems because they understand that, the, that, it, that it's not working in, um, in our systems today because it's a trusting system. Uh, we will be going to uh, a, a three um, channel model. Uh, the, the third one, the third one is going to be introduced next year. Um, they've already modernized the LBTS into links. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're still in the stage where we don't have information. We have good money transfer based on trust, but we don't have good information. And so when you look at the dollar, it could be one of two ways, soon one of three ways that it can get into your account, but none of them, I shouldn't say that, Lynx is a irrevocable system. If you have, if they use the Lynx system, then you have a dollar, an actual dollar you can use immediately. But how do you know which one it is? Well, Lynx puts out as LBTS did, but we never uh, knew about it before, uh, but Lynx puts out this PCRN. It's a payment confirmation reference number. Um, and when you have that number, then you know because it's only emitted by the system once the instructions are into the system and the system is executed. And so when a lawyer sends instructions or anybody sends instructions by um, in the link system on their computer, they get a confirmation. That confirmation should have the PCRN. How do you recognize the PCRN? It basically is a number that starts with four letters, LBTS, the large value transfer system. They kept that. Um, and then nine numbers. If you have that PCRN, 
when you're getting confirmation, because I know that the trend is for lawyers to send a copy of the confirmation to the uh, uh, receiving lawyer and say, here, I've sent my instructions for the wire. Uh, they, you should ensure that they're including in that receipt, the PCRN. Then you go to your bank, because you know the money is in the bank. Uh, you've seen it on your, on your screen. And so what you do is you ask your bank for the PCRN they got. Now banks under the, under the Bank Act, under the, their, their rules are required, if requested, to give you the PCRN. So if you have the PCRN from the lawyer who's sending, you have the PCRN that the bank received, you match them up, you know you're in Lynx system, Lynx is an irrevocable system, it's an actual dollar, it's not a credit. Anything else, if you don't have that, is credit. And so then you take the risk, if you use that dollar immediately, that it could be pulled back. You may be able to send it out, and then later the bank will pull it back out. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have, you confirm the PCRN, received it from the sending lawyer, received it from your bank, and then you are in um, uh, a good stead to use that money immediately. And on to Mona. Sorry there, I think I'd be able to take myself off mute faster. <laughs> um, another tip that I would recommend is uh, consider what your data storage and your retention policies are. So um, I suspect you have them. If you don't, this is a good time to start thinking about them. But basically know where your client's personal information is being stored and understand how you are protecting it. Um, take, consider who's got access to that information and whether that access should be limited. Um, but most importantly, consider what you are keeping and storing in your email inbox or in folders in your email account. Um, my biggest tip is get it out of there and get it into secure client portals. Um, all too often when a hacker does gain access to a lawyer's email account, it becomes an absolute nightmare when the lawyer has kept thousands of emails or documents you know, over the course of several years in their email account. So the less you have in your inbox, the better you will be from a legal and a privacy perspective in the event of a breach. So um, data retention is a big, big hot tip. Absolutely. And Ray is going to close us out with a final couple of tips here. Um, the important thing with cyber uh, security um, is how do you deal with it? Um, this is not an insurable issue. Um, yes, you can get insurance, but that's not the way. As Judah's mentioned before, um, the fence at the top of the hill or the ambulance at the bottom of the hill. Uh, insurance is the ambulance and it's too late. You've been injured. Um, so what you want to do is you want to prevent it. And so that's why, because a lot of people ask, well, why didn't LawPro just implement uh, cyber insurance for all lawyers? Uh, again, because it's not a, a matter that's really dealt with or properly dealt with insured by insurance. Uh, it's an education matter. And by coming to this program, you're educating yourself, but more importantly is to educate also your staff and your clients uh, in what they can anticipate. So if a client comes in, you should um, have some kind of a tagline somewhere or some kind of a reminder to them uh, to call before they click uh, to make sure that they don't, they're not sending the money because unfortunately we've had lawyers who reported that their clients got notification before closing the money the whole you know, $200,000 is gone. Um, the day the lawyer calls for the money, uh, it's not there. It's no longer available. Um, staff it also is very important. Um, many times lawyers have called us to tell us, uh, the lawyer received the, 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 the discharge statement from the bank, looked at it and was, fair, was very satisfied with the, with the document, gave it to staff and instructed them to pay. It's staff that noticed that it, they had changed from a check to pay the um, discharge uh, to a wire. Um, and out of curiosity, the staff called the bank, um, their contact that they've dealt with for, for a number of years uh, to say, geez, I, I just noticed that you changed your, your status. Um, and uh, to be told by the bank at that time that not only did they not send, um, a, a, that they did not ask for a wire, but they didn't even send a discharge statement. Um, it had been completely made up from a document that they picked up somewhere else, um, obviously. Uh, so the more eyes there are on the transaction, on the documentation, on the processes, uh, the better. Uh, this is really a team effort uh, to be able to um, avoid being the victims, um, and having your clients become the victims, 
uh, or any individual uh, being a victim of a cyber uh, cyber uh, risk. Uh, and so uh, by all means, please educate yourself, educate your colleagues, educate your staff. This is something we should be talking about. Uh, this is not something we don't, we should not be talking about. We should be talking about it be between colleagues, between law firms, uh, to finding out what others are doing. This is the best situation because if somebody has a better way of doing it, let's adopt it. Um, fraudsters are out there. They're, they're collaborating. <laughs> fraudsters are collaborating on what is working. Um, so we should be collaborating on to make sure what ways that we can stop them from uh, getting uh, their successes um, so that they don't uh, ruin our days. Um, and of course, if things go wrong, uh, call somebody, call a colleague, um, call somebody else, but also call us. Uh, LawPro has a, um, a fraud hotline. Uh, you call the customer service number. Uh, you tell them that it's a fraud issue. We have a team that's basically uh, ready to be able to, to assist you, uh, to talk you through, uh, to give you some advice, to give you some information, to give you some resources. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, we like getting those calls because we much prefer st preventing it than uh, having to open a claim and to start processing it. And I, as you, as we've talked about before, this is not something typically that we cover in, um, in our coverage. Um, and uh, uh, in any event, our coverage would be third party. And so if your client loses because of you, uh, then yes, uh, the client may be covered, uh, but your cost of, of investigating your IT, fixing your IT system, uh, whatever needs to be done, uh, notifications for data breach, privacy breach, and so on, uh, those are not covered. Uh, and even though there are there is insurance out there, basically what we are told is there's a long checklist of things that you have to do and to put in place before they will give you insurance um, and not cheaply. Um, and so uh, please give us a call. Um, and uh, be on the, on the lookout. Judah, back to you. Thanks, Ray and Mona. So just to wrap it up, key tips, implement your two-factor, okay? Call before you click. Where you can, where it's available, you should check that you've got good credit before anything goes out by check confirming the PCRN on wires. Start to think about your data retention policies. That might just be a longer term, you know, strategic initiative that you and your firm are gonna to need to think about, but where's your data saved? Is it secure? Uh, who has access and how do you protect that information? Because you work in, you're a knowledge worker, you're working in a knowledge economy and the fraudsters are seeking that knowledge. And finally, train your staff and clients. This really is as strong as your weakest link. So you're all in this together. Bonus tip is if it goes wrong, contact us. You know, if it's a wire fraud, let us know. If it's a ransomware, it probably won't be covered, but you can still reach out to us uh, just in case. So we're going to move now from cyber to another scary area. And I'm sorry, I know Halloween's coming. We should scare you maybe next month. And, and we will with a real estate program that you should join us for. But we're going to talk about property owner impersonation frauds because we are seeing a significant spike and not just us, we know that many air people in the real estate realm are seeing significant increases in property owner impersonation fraud. So like I said at the top of the program, this is a situation where fraudsters are securing private mortgages against properties that they don't own by pretending to be the owner. And then uh, in some cases, they're even just pretending to sell the property to unsuspecting buyers. That level of fraud is, is, is deeply troubling, and we're seeing it on the rise. The proceeds of the mortgage or of the sale get directed to them, and then they run with the funds. And by that point, we've got real problems to uh, you know, try to make sure that a mortgage can be uh, deleted from title, uh, making sure that we can undo a transaction if there was, in fact, uh, a, a, you know, an innocent purchaser but where the buyer uh, was, was uh, not in fact trying, or the, where the, the seller, sorry, was not in fact uh, uh, genuinely seeking, the, the, the real owner was not trying to sell the property. So these are complex, they're costly, and they're stressful. So Ray and I are gonna walk you through how these frauds typically work. Ray is gonna start us off with the private mortgage fraud and what we're seeing right now. Um, Ray, take it away. Uh, yeah, so in this situation, um, institutional mortgagers and mortgagees uh, typically have 
uh, a number of safeguards put in place, a number of procedures, a number of, of steps you have to go through, um, and uh, more sophisticated, if you want, uh, 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 ability uh, to be able to weed out uh, problem files. Uh, not that they are 100% um, successful at it, uh, but they typically have more. And so, of course, fraudsters are going to look for the easy prey. Um, what's a low-hanging fruit? And uh, although there are many private lenders who have a very sophisticated system, uh, there are many that don't. Um, and they just rely on the fact that, oh, I've got an opportunity to lend money. I'm going to make a great return. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead with it. And so uh, we see private mortgages being more uh, susceptible to this type of fraud. Uh, where uh, you have somebody coming in and purporting to be the owner. And uh, uh, so what you have is you have uh, somebody who, uh, and also they don't work in, in isolation. Uh, they may be working uh, with other parties. Uh, although in interestingly, sometime, some years back, uh, we were part of a police uh, group when we were looking at fraud and the police had arrested an individual. He had 13 cell phones on him. Um, on the back of the cell phone was the name of the character that he was, the mortgage broker, the banker, the uh, borrower, the uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so depending what phone rang, he would pick it up and answer uh, and play that role. Um, that's uh, maybe something a little more sophisticated, uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes they just, they're, they're in pairs. They're, they're, they're a number of people working together. Um, and so you have an appraiser, you have, uh, you know, a, a mortgage broker and, and, and so on. They will have convincing documentation. Um, you look at the ID. Um, we should be paying more attention to what the ID looks like, uh, paying more attention to uh, it, comparing the picture. We've had an unfortunate situation where basically uh, you looked at the picture and you looked at the person who presented themselves. Uh, they were not close. Uh, they were not even related um, in the same family. Um, it should have been very obvious. Um, but the lawyer basically said, I got the idea, photocopied, put it in my file. Um, not good enough. Uh, you need to be able to uh, look at it and, and make sure. Yes, there may be age difference, uh, but typically people uh, look like themselves in pictures. And, and that's one of the easy things you should be looking at. You should be looking on the data. You should be looking at how it's set up. Um, there's more sophisticated, and we had some information on that, and we have a, a number of articles uh, on that. Um, one of the things that we have, and I had somebody who, who uh, used to propose that, you know, it, your property is safe if you have a mortgage on it, because the fraudsters go for the vacant properties, the properties that don't have a mortgage or very little mortgage. Um, yes, of course, easy fruit, uh, but it's just an extra step. I mean, they just falsely discharge the existing mortgage. Um, in fact, when they usually are doing uh, the, 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 the mortgaging situation, they will usually mortgage it two and three times. They will go to one lender, uh, get a mortgage, put it in place, um, it gets registered, they discharge it, go to a second lender, get the second mortgage on, third mortgage on, well, in fact, it's the third, fourth, uh, second, third, and fourth, because the existing mortgage is already there, and they discharge it uh, uh, and basically run away with the money. Um, so having a mortgage um, is really no protection. It off, it, you know, it's an extra step they have to go through. Um, and, but it's still uh, something that's there. How do they get to these properties? Um, well, they'll use uh, Google uh, to be able to uh, be able to get pictures. They'll use the MLS system to get pictures of the property so that they can show somebody. Um, if somebody actually insists on seeing the property, um, they may rent it um, or they may Airbnb the property. In fact, we're seeing a rash of properties now that are coming up. Um, that have been RB, uh, Airbnb, and basically um, the person is there for the weekend or the week, uh, and they are able to show uh, the uh, uh, the appraiser the, for the bank to come in, uh, and, and so on. And so, uh, very much uh, in a situation where they pretend to be the owner of the property, uh, they arrange for the mortgage, um, and of course, once it's in place, uh, they run away with the uh, with the funds. Um, title insurers have been um, reacting to this. Uh, some will no longer um, uh, insure private mortgages uh, over $500,000. Um, and when we say over 500,000, it's in the aggregate. So if your first mortgage is 300, uh, first private mortgage is 300, second private mortgage is 300, in the aggregate that's 600, they won't insure the second one if they insured the first one. 
Um, and so that is something they're looking at. Uh, there are approved lists, of course, but again, then that's a title insurer going through more um, uh, information to try to verify uh, that we have a legitimate uh, transaction uh, in case. Uh, and so it definitely is something that we have to look out for something we have to pay a bit more attention um, and we're finding that uh, right now uh, the target uh, you know there's a flavor of the day for all of these things as Mona was talking about uh, ebbs and flows and right now the private mortgages seems to be the favorite target uh, at this point in real estate uh, that may change in a little while uh, but that seems to be uh, the situation at this point. Judah? We're certainly seeing a lot of those, uh, and, and so it's it's really become an issue uh, that uh, that requires uh, heightened diligence. But it's not just the refi. We're starting to also see some where the homeowner impersonation has been used on a sale. The only difference, material difference, is that instead of slapping a mortgage on a property and running with the proceeds, they're literally pretending to sell the property as the owner and running away with the proceeds. So it's just by degree, it's one other change. By the time the lawyer's involved, they've already usually sold the property. They've already represented to an agent or possibly working with others within the system to uh, purport uh, the sale. And by the time the property's targeted uh, or the, by the time the actual owner knows of what's happened, it's too late, something's already the, the, the transaction is closed. Often, usually, in these cases, the properties have been targeted and the true owner is not living in the residence at the time. Uh, think about your snowbird. Think about somebody who may be spending time up north in the summer, uh, cottage country, somebody who uh, may be spending their, their time split between uh, Toronto and uh, another area or Ontario and another uh, Canadian jurisdiction or spending time abroad. In any of these cases, if it's sort of on a predictable scope, oh, we know that, you know, Judah is going to Monaco again this year to enjoy his life. Uh, this is entirely hypothetical. Uh, but, you know, if that was true and everyone knows that come summertime, Judah is off on the Riviera, then the Toronto pied -a terre is now vacant, then that's a good time for a fraudster to potentially try to infiltrate pretend to be me and go off and try to sell that to usually an innocent purchaser who just gets caught up in the mess of the follow-up. Uh, so that's the only real difference, but in either of these, the same tips apply. So we're gonna share three quick tips um, and Ray, uh, maybe you can start us off with that. Uh, yeah, so know the red flags and uh, in, in any transaction. And we have an article that basically lists uh, 12 examples of it. Let me go through them quickly. Um, if you get a large number of referrals from a new source and you'll have a broker uh, or, an or a real estate agent that comes in and says they have lots of deals for you, uh, you don't know these people. Um, and of course, uh, they're saying, well, you know, if you do this right, you're going to get a lot more. Um, uh, that can be uh, a tip. Great business to have, uh, but that could be a tip that uh, this is not a good situation. Uh, similar transactions over a short time frame. So uh, first, second, third mortgage uh, situation. Um, you need to start asking why, because typical people mortgage for long term, uh, not short term. Uh, rush transactions. Uh, there's always reason for the rush, uh, but you need to understand that and you should be asking that client what's the rush in getting this transaction because typically when they try to rush you they're going to try to cut corners they're going to try to get you to ignore things or not have the time to appreciate the red flags and so rush transactions uh, are typically found uh, in uh, fraud situations and we need to find out uh, where that goes uh, no funds going through a law firm trust account uh, that is uh, fraud, but also anti-money laundering. Uh, and uh, if there's no money going through, how can you verify that that is a legitimate mortgage? Um, these types of mortgages are uh, a, a clear example of anti-money laundering. Uh, the criminal code has been changed. And so a lawyer can be, resp can be found liable criminally for anti-money laundering for simply being reckless. No intent to do to deal with it, no knowledge of it, but you're reckless in not identifying it and preventing it. Um, and so uh, that is why the uh, Law Society put in place some safeguards and some, and some documents to be able to, to help. 
Um, all the funds are being transferred out of Canada. Um, we have many people from many countries in Canada. There are many reasons why the money may go out. Again, uh, dig deeper because that is one of the flags that, that we see. Um, the homeowner didn't receive the funds um, or no funds were advanced. You know, typically when you're doing a mortgage, you're doing a sale, uh, somebody's, you know, the owner is getting the money and they don't, uh, that's an unusual transaction. Again, that should be a flag. Any one of these is not a, a determination that there's fraud, but it may raise at that level where you should be asking more questions. And that's what we're saying is when you see those flags come up, then you should be asking more questions. You ask more questions, the fraudsters typically don't like answering questions. They'll answer one and two, and then they'll move on. Um, it saves you. Of course, they're going to another colleague, but then that's their problem. And uh, uh, you know, hopefully we can make it more difficult uh, for them. Uh, the lender doesn't require post-dated checks. What lender would not want to have money uh, to make sure that they're they're getting payment? Um, the broker or the mortgage agent is not registered, uh, a licensed uh, a broker. Um, again, situation they should be. Um, client does not want title insurance. Um, when clients are dictating how you do your law, your legal work, um, then you should be questioning um, because that means they understand the system. They understand the scrutiny that goes in with the title insurance policy or with other searches, uh, and you should be uh, mindful of that. Um, you receive instructions uh, uh, and uh, the direction of funds is, is different. Again, uh, same situation. Um, and uh, ID documentation doesn't look quite right. Um, so you want to look at all of those situations, all of those tips, uh, all of those things to be able to weed out whether or not you have a situation that you should be asking more questions. And that's all we're saying is if you see one of these flags, ask more questions. Judah? Yeah, and that actually is the second tip. So first tip is know the red flags. And Ray's gone through in a whirlwind, but don't worry. We have a resource in the materials called Watch for Real Estate Frauds Involving Pri Private Mortgages. And it goes through all of these uh, in detail. And you can use that article sort of as the jumping off point for if it's a purchase and sale as well. A lot of those flags are similar. Uh, so you can use those red flags generally. And as Ray mentioned, the uh, Law Society has resources that describe the red flags uh, in detail as we do in the materials. So we've got links to Law Society resources. Uh, we've also got uh, some of our uh, Law Pro resources. The second tip is around your client and it's to ask your clients lots of questions. You know, if you're acting for a purported vendor, sometimes on these deals, you know, a really good question is why are you coming to me? Why aren't you using the lawyer you used when you bought this property? What changed? Why wouldn't you just go back to whoever served you the first time? And you know, if you're acting for a vendor, they might have a good answer for that, but don't stop there. How do they find you? Why didn't they go with someone else? How did they pick you? This all might sound, you know, like a lot, but this due diligence matters. We're at times seeing that the lawyers are being preyed on deliberately. In fact, almost always. And we're seeing some things that should give you some cause for pause. For example, if the vendor has a property in downtown Toronto, let's just say, although this could be anywhere in Ontario, and they go and they find a lawyer in Barry. Why? Why are they using a Barry lawyer to do a real estate transaction in Toronto? I mean, you can do that, but why you? Why did they find you? If they're living in Toronto, why are they reaching out to a lawyer in Barry? And we see this sometimes. We see people who are finding counsel and where there is no rational connection between how they have purchased a pro or they are intending to sell a property and how they found the lawyer. How did they find you? A Barry real estate lawyer or a Barry lawyer who does the occasional real estate deal isn't gonna trip, trip up and show up top of page on Google when you're trying to sell a Toronto house. How did they find you? There'd better be really good answers 
Usually there are good answers. I have a friend, this person did a deal with you. Okay, right? You're a certified specialist. I found you on the Law Society directory. I did a Google search and you were the first to come up based on geography. There are all sorts of ways that people find lawyers. If you have no idea how this person found you, that's a red flag. I should say though, that just because somebody does swing the vine doesn't mean that that is the end. We have seen cases where people in particular groups have said, I, am, I have been referred by such and such person. And that such and such person either did not conduct that referral or was also a bad apple in a series of frauds. And so just how they found you is not in and of itself enough. You have to look at the totality of the situation. How do they find you? Why are they, did they retain you? Why did they choose you? And check the ID, which we're gonna discuss momentarily. For financing, you're also gonna to wanna to dig deeper. You know, if somebody has a home equity line of credit on property or a first mortgage, why are they coming back and seeking more, more on a refi? You know, if somebody's selling a property, why now? How did you determine price? Who's the agent? If you didn't use an agent, why not in a softening market, right? How does this compare comp-wise to just quickly checking on MLS? What's going on in this deal and does it add up? Does it look right? And ask about title insurance. And if it's being declined, that's a real red flag, right? Why are you declining title insurance? Do you know what title insurance is? Why would you be declining it? If somebody's declining title insurance, it might be because they don't wanna go through the client ID and verification that the title insurers have imposed. So you're gonna to wanna to ask a lot of questions of your own clients to make sure that you understand why they have come to you for a transaction. And that's part of the trust relationship, right? A client should be able to quite happily and trustingly tell their lawyer why they've come to you today, what their intention is, and you can get behind that to better serve them. But if it's not adding up, that's a problem. So step one is know those red flags. And then step two is on your own side of the deal, really ask lots of questions of your own client, right? And just to follow up on that, uh, basically it comes down to due diligence and training, training your staff, uh, training yourself, uh, training your colleagues, uh, but the due diligence also very important. Um, I know that many lawyers uh, are uh, finding that the, there's so much more demand on them. Uh, they're not getting the money that they think they should. Uh, and so they may be tempted to cut the due diligence. Uh, wrong situation. Um, if you're not being paid enough to do the proper due diligence, then don't do that area of law. Um, you know, make sure that you are being uh, compensated for the proper work that needs to be done. Uh, does that mean you're going to lose some clients because they, they want something cheaper? Yes. Uh, but uh, what I found through the years, and I practiced for 25 years, uh, was basically that uh, the ones who were looking for just price um, that I didn't get, uh, when my colleagues talked to me about the fact that they did get them because they were told that they didn't come to me, um, those were the ones that were the more difficult clients. Um, and so you're not doing yourself a service. Uh, make sure you keep that due diligence in place. Uh, Judah mentioned about the fact that I got a referral. Um, I have a client, a friend in Ottawa who is practicing, uh, got a referral. Uh, a client came in uh, on the phone, out of country, uh, sending them money. Uh, they were going to be closing a transaction. Uh, they were putting the money in a trust account. Uh, and the lawyer asked, how did you get my, my name? Uh, and he said, uh, oh, uh, so-and-so, uh, which is an agent that was referring, real estate agent, that was referring a lot of business to this, to this lawyer. Um, and so out of courtesy, uh, the lawyer called the, the, uh, the agent and thanked him for sending him the business. And the client, the, 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 the agent said, well, sorry, who, what? Um, and so he explains that, you know, he had a new client and uh, all of this money came into his trust account and basically, um, you know, they had re been referred by him. And he said, well, I don't remember that. I, I, I'm not acting, that's not one of my clients. Um, but he says, interesting enough, last week, 
somebody called to ask who I was referring my legal work to. And I gave your name. And so um, the lawyer was a little more suspicious. Um, the next day, the client called to say the deal transaction had been uh, aborted and basically wanted the money refunded. And could they wire it because they needed it? And now they were being transferred to another city. Uh, again, plausible story. Uh, but we transferred to another city and could he wire the money uh, to another account? Um, he happened to call me because we had been talking earlier about this type of situation. And I said, hold off, uh, banking system doesn't work that way. It's not instantaneous money unless you can confirm that you actually have a dollar. All you have is a credit. Don't send a credit out because you may be short. Um, and that's exactly what happened. He waited a couple of days. The bank then called to say that the check that uh, had been deposited in his account had bounced uh, and that they were pulling the credit uh, at that time. So your due diligence is not just of the transaction, but it's of the clients to understand who you're dealing with uh, and to understand the full transaction and get those, uh, those questions. Again, when you're asking questions, fraudsters don't like it. They have a certain scenario. They go down to a certain depth. But after that, you're becoming too much of a problem. You're going to identify it. They rather, you know, pull their stake and go somewhere else. And so make it difficult for them. Don't make it easy because that only makes it difficult for you uh, in the long run. Uh, Judah, back to you. Thanks, Ray. So you know, all this to say, it's uh, it's tricky out there with these with these client ID frauds, with these owner impersonation frauds, and so. For the last part of our program today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about client ID. You know, Hollywood makes it seem easy. You've always got these like kids trying to get into the bar underage, or you've got the spy movies of James Bond or Jason Bourne trying to like, you know, get from border to border. But the truth is, is that organized crime and fraudsters are manipulating IDs and using fake ID and per perpetrating ID frauds. And so we wanna spend a bit of time about how you can be prepared. First, we need to uh, identify that sometimes real ID is being used for fraud. We've seen cases where uh, the client is, is uh, the, 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 the actual homeowner has lost their ID or their ID has been stolen. And then it's been made it's made its way to fraudsters who have used it to perpetrate a fraud. Uh, but more often it is fake IDs that are being used. And so uh, for starters, fake driver's licenses. Now you can always check, and I'd suggest personally that you check the Ministry of Transportation's website where you can punch in the license code to see if it's correct. And there have been frauds foiled where the fraudster has changed the license code and it turns out that that code has not been issued by the MTO. But that's just the start because sometimes the fraudsters are using a legitimate license plate number, a legitimate license rather, and then changing characteristics. They're swapping out a photo, they're changing names. And so you really want to take the time to check IDs. We've seen a few of these where there are issues. For example, we've seen a couple of cases come in where the same photo has appeared on identification, but there's a different level of government authorizing the identification. Imagine if I give you my passport and my driver's license and it's the same mugshot. That shouldn't be happening. I went to the passport office after getting a photo that I got taken by a third party and you know, gave that to Passport Ontario. If I'm at the MTO, I took a ticket, I waited in line just like everyone else, I waited for them to take my picture. So that's a real red flag, that's a, a showstopper right there. You're done if you see an, uh, that sort of issue. We've also seen issues where people are taking what are legitimate IDs, but where there are flaws. So one that's come up uh, uh, from time to time that we've seen are citizenship cards. Now we always want to make sure that we're not doing anything inappropriate with people based on their, their you know, migratory status, but citizenship cards were retired years ago by the federal government. They can be valid, but if they're being used, you need to just be cautious to make sure that the person 
is in fact the person who is uh, is the owner of the citizenship card that it is a legitimate id if that card is being laminated it is no longer legitimate id some of the security details have been compromised that means that for a citizenship card you might ask them to see it if you're doing a zoom deal you might want to see it but you also might want to bring it in person and ask them to attend your office so that you can actually check it depending on the type of id being presented that still might be your best way to screen ray we're seeing corporate frauds too what are you seeing in terms of the manipulation there uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, individuals are not the only ones. Uh, corporations have had their ID stolen and continue to have it. Um, under the old system and unfortunately under the new Ontario Business Registry, we're still seeing the situation where we have fraudsters filing false Form 1. The Form 1, as you know, we can change the directors and officers and uh, the uh, corporate headquarters. Um, and so what we have is we have the fraudsters uh, filing a form one, naming themselves as the director, uh, going into the law firm with a minute book. Um, now it's totally made up. Uh, how you're going to identify that, I'm not quite sure, uh, because again, it's false documentation. They're good at doing this. Um, and uh, they will have ID. Um, it, may be, it may be their personal ID. It may be a uh, false ID. Uh, but they're representing at this point that they are the shareholders. Of course, we know there's no registry of shareholders in the minute book. Yes, but not in um, in the, uh, uh, the the system. And so all we have is the directors and officers. And so these forum, you do your corporate search, uh, you get a co corporate profile, and it shows you who the directors and officers are. Uh, if you stop there, then it's difficult. Uh, you should be asking, unfortunately now, because the system has been compromised, you should be asking for a listing of all filings done by the corporation. If you see that the Form 1 is a recent uh, filing, you may want to start asking about it. Of course, they're going to tell you they bought the corporation from the owners or there's a story there. But again, trying to get that information, trying to understand how they got to be the owners of that corporation recently um, and, and to go through that. Uh, so we do, do need to, to look at that uh, and those false, false filings. Um, the new business registry, of course, has a corporate number. And so it becomes a little more difficult, but we don't know how many false form ones are already in the system. And in fact, um, anybody, you used to go to a government, re government registry office and the government offices, you showed up there with the right amount of money and they accepted your form one. Didn't matter who you were, no identification required. Um, you could do it through lawyers. And of course, lawyers, we have an obligation to, to verify our client's identity, but that was cut off with the new uh, registry. Now you go to a third party service provider um, so unfortunately, I think all they've done is taken the system going to a government offices, going now to a private third party uh, service, uh, service provider, uh, again, who we don't understand they have any obligation to verify any ID. Um, again, if the right filing fee is there, they file it. Um, and so we are asking the ministry for confirmation of that and seeing how that has been blocked. The, the new twist that we saw uh, just recently, um, corporation, the individual has a corporation, numbered company. Um, they registered a business name uh, that they operate the, uh, the numbered company under. Um, they recently received a notice by CRA saying that there's a new uh, CRA number being created for the corporation, which is a, a recent incorporation under the using the registered name. And so the client called their lawyer and go, what is this? I didn't register a new company. Why, what, what's happening? Um, of course, can't get any information. Uh, so we are in discussion with the ministry at this point. Uh, it was brought to my attention. I contacted the ministry uh, and we're waiting to hear uh, what's going on. CRA, they called the police. The police said basically they take a report but aren't gonna investigate. Interesting enough, when they incorporated this new company using the business registry, the, the registered business name, they use the same corporate director's name. So I gather they're going to be impersonating um, the director. Uh, I gather with false ID, not quite sure what they're doing with it. Um, they've asked for a CRA number um, and that's how they got hold of it because CRA contacted the legitimate owner. Um, 
they reported the CRA saying we didn't incorporate the company. CRA is looking into it. They say it's 30 days before they'll look, they'll respond. Uh, and so we're waiting to see what happens. But basically, we could have somebody show up with now a newly incorporated company. The story obviously would be that I was operating under um, a, a operating name, but now I've decided to incorporate the company. Um, and to do what? I'm not quite sure what assets are in that corporation or what they're doing, but it's something that we have to be mindful of when we're dealing with a company. Uh, so when you're looking at uh, fraud, basically reducing the, uh, the, the, the risk, what you wanna do is you wanna take the time to look at the ID. Uh, I know that most people photocopy it, put it in a file, that's just not good enough. Uh, we need to take the time, review it, compare the, the, the image, uh, compare the various uh, so, uh, sources you have. Um, meeting in, in, in person is the best, although I understand a lot of people are doing your remote uh, transactions, especially with COVID, but also coming out of it. Clients prefer. Why would a client want to go to your office? The, Clients typically did not want to come to my office. Uh, they would have been pleased if they could have done it over the phone. Uh, so it makes our job more complicated because you don't actually get to handle that little piece of paper or that uh, ID. Um, and so you're going to see it on the screen. There's my ID. Uh, that's going to be very difficult to be able to uh, really appreciate. Uh, they're going to send you a copy, but it's a copy. Um, again, difficult to, to uh, it, it really find the subtleties there. So it, it makes our job more difficult and riskier. Uh, and so you want to spend a little more time dealing with it. If you're concerned, start asking questions. Um, ask them when they have their ID, what's their date of birth, what's their uh, partner's date of birth, uh, uh, what's their address, uh, things that they should know that's on the ID. But of course, if it's false, then they won't necessarily have it. Uh, but the good fraudsters will. I mean, they will have a certain amount of information that's there. Um, so take a look at that to see uh, what there is. Look if there's no inconsistencies between them. Uh, as uh, Judah mentioned, the same picture. Um, or the age different. Uh, you can find that one ID is 10 years ago, and yet the pictures are look, there's no 10 year difference. Um, now, mind you, you know, they may just look good um, and have preserved better than others, but uh, that is, you know, an indication that you're, you know, are you dealing with the same situation? This is difficult. Uh, it's not easy. Um, but if we spend a little more time at it, uh, then it should be uh, easier to, to be able to do it. Mona, you have some insights yeah. also so if, if as ray mentioned if client identification and verification keeps you up at night especially if you're still meeting with clients remotely or you've continued to meet with clients remotely you know there's a number of third-party platforms that can be used to independently verify client ids um, examples include you know verify.me vaulty uh, tree fort transunion these are just to name a few each will have different authoring offerings but generally you can expect that these programs will provide you with a digital process to identify and authenticate a client before you meet with them. Um, now, using the words identify and authenticate, we often use them in interchangeably, but they are in fact different. So Ray talked at length about how you identify somebody. So uh, using a statement or uh, of your identity, for example, I am Mona Hanna, I am a client of John Doe. That's my, I'm, I'm identifying myself and I can do that with an ID. Authentication takes it further and involves a verification of the claim or the statement of identity. Um, and we often use some type of detail only known to the individual who you're authenticating. Um, if you'll recall from what Judah presented earlier, the funds transfer instructions verification checklist, under the third item on that checklist, um, it says on file opening, obtain a password from the client and record it in the physical file. So this is an example of authenticating a client. Um, and keep in mind that when you're collecting these types of details or the details that Ray discussed, like your partner's name, your, your date of birth, your address, you should be obtaining proper and informed consent from whomever you're collecting this information from. But, you know, if you collect a password from your client at file opening, this is a way to authenticate an individual's identity, you know, when you deal with them later on. Um, you can also authenticate using information like an account number, a favorite color, a name of their first pet. Um, you can authenticate using something an individual has, like a bank card, an ID, a token, or a public key digital certificate, which is like an, a, a digital passport um, that's, you know, you're able to obtain it from a certificate authority. It gets a bit complicated, but it's another form of, of authentication. 
You can use biometric data. So your facial image or a retina scan that, you know, we often use with our iPhones or our Nexus memberships, for example, that's a form of authentication. Um, and these are just very brief examples, but you're going to want to authenticate your client's identity every time you meet with them to ensure you're continuing to meet with the same, uh, same individual. But um, there's a great resource from the Privacy Commissioner's Office uh, that explains in depth the difference between authentication and, and identification. I would encourage you to have a look at it. But of course, depending on the level of risk involved, sometimes authentication will use more than one of these methods that I've described. And as I mentioned, there are third party platforms that will take care of these steps for you. Thank you, Mona. And as a I mean, the third party verification is a great way to go. Um, that's not the standard yet, uh, not expected of every lawyer um, in a regular transaction. But when you get into those situations where you're asking more questions, where you have some issues, where you think there's risk, um, then that may be a great way to be able to deal with what you have. Um, and so the takeaways is to be alert when you're meeting with the client, uh, especially if it's remotely you want to be able to uh, overcome the fact that you're not in that uh, in that room. Um, who else is in the room um, and uh, who else is influencing that person? Who else is coaching that person? Are you truly getting uh, true instructions from the, uh, the, the, the proper party? Uh, make sure you're getting the client's ID. You're checking it carefully. We've talked about that a number of times. Law Society has requirements for uh, the ID verification. Uh, we've linked that in the materials. Uh, and we have a number of articles uh, for you and your staff. Um, and I encourage you to, um, you know, print out the materials, uh, circulate it to your staff, have a brief staff meeting uh, to review what the process is, what the concerns are, uh, and to be able to make sure that there are more eyes on this, looking at the situation, that it's a team effort, that you're working together for one goal, uh, that's protecting your clients, protecting yourself, protecting the firm uh, going forward, and that you're only dealing with good uh, situations uh, and that they don't have something come back and bite you and have to deal with a claim uh, or putting up money for money that has been lost. Uh, so with that, I send it back to Judah. Well, thanks, Ray. Uh, so, you know, we've got, uh, we've got lots for people to take away here, uh, lots to review in our program resources. Uh, but, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today, and thank you for sticking with us. We've, we've covered off the updates on wire fraud. We've covered the new uh, or, you know, more prevalent, uh, I shouldn't say new, they've been around for ages, but we're seeing a lot of the owner impersonation frauds. Uh, and we've talked a bit about client ID and verification, not just what is required under your professional rules, but how you can go further than that uh, to reduce your risks. So I wanna thank you all uh, for coming today. Uh, it's been a really lively chat, lots of Q and A's as we went through. So thank you all. Uh, the program itself, we've had some questions about it. It is eligible for an hour and a half of professionalism uh, and for LawPro's risk management credit, which you can claim at lawpro.ca. The program's also going to be available as a replay at practicepro.ca's webpage. Uh, you can see that there's a CPD section. You click on it, you go to today's program. Uh, you can also uh, when the program is ready, we'll send out a post via avoidacclaim.com. So if you want to be in the know for when the update uh, is available, when the replay is available, you can just subscribe to Avoid a Claim and you'll get an email sent out to you. Just a reminder that our next sessions in our tip series with Toronto Lawyers, Asso Toronto Lawyers Association are tips for real estate lawyers. That's happening October 6th and tips for corporate commercial lawyers uh, on November 3rd. Each of those programs are eligible for professionalism credit. They're each eligible for the Law Pro Risk Management credit. You can register online at Toronto Lawyers Association. It is free to do so. All are welcome. If you are not a member of the TLA, although I encourage you to be one, uh, if you are not a member, you can just register on the non-member area of the registration page. So as always, we wanna thank Toronto Lawyers Association for continuing this wonderful partnership with LawPro. They make these sessions so smooth on our end and we appreciate it. We know they've also been helping some of you uh, register successfully today. Thank you to Ontario's law associations 
for also promoting this event. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Ray, for sharing your expertise. And lastly, please remember, TLA will be emailing all of you who are here live today a program evaluation. Please complete it. It'll take like two minutes, but it helps us understand what's working, what's not, and where we should be focusing uh, our next programming to give you the just-in-time tips that you need to succeed. If you've got other comments or you just want to reach out, we're always ready at practicepro at lawpro.ca. So that concludes our program. Take care. Thank you for coming and hope that you're all enjoying the back to school season. All the best.